So in this lecture, we are going to talk about energy system integration. Let me start the lecture with this question from you. As you know, the EU aims to reach carbon neutrality by 2015. To reach these decarbonization targets, we are going to need electrification. So what do you think would be the role of electrification? Would it be the only way forward or is it only a part of the final solution? If your answer was the second one, as electrification is only a part of the solution, you were right. Electrifying all sectors of economy is not an easy issue. It's not cost efficient and it's not possible. Why? Because there are so, so, some sectors of the economy which are hard to electrify, including heavy industries, steel, glass, cement, etc., or uh, heavy transport sectors, which are very hard to electrify. Besides these hard to electrify sectors, the matter is the cost. We will have to in, we will have to bear high costs to integrate high amounts of renewable electricity generation into the power sector. This will mean that we are going to resolve some flexibility and stability issues. Currently, these issues are solved using gas-fired power plants across the EU. So as you can see, electric sector is still is depending on the gas sector to solve some issues regarding flexibility. This will bring us to the concept of sector coupling. What is sector coupling? Sector coupling was first introduced in Germany to address and to refer to supply side of sector, electricity sector and gas sectors. And then it was during the Madrid Forum in 2018, which again, this concept sector coupling surfaced and afterwards it became a hot topic between researchers and policymakers across the EU. So what does sector coupling mean? Sector coupling means increasingly interlinking, interlinking the electricity and gas sectors and to consider the supply side of electricity and gas sectors in this process and to couple them with each other. So it means either from gas to power or from, from power to gas. Gas to power is not a new uh, concept. It has been in place actually for decades. We already use combined cycle gas turbines to generate electricity. What is new is power to gas, which means that we are going to convert electricity into gases. And we do this with two purposes in mind. One purpose is to convert electricity to gases in order to store electricity. So we are going to use these gases as some storage for electricity and to actually convert these gases to power in the future. The second purpose was, is to actually convert electricity to these gases and to use these gases either as feedstock in industry or other applications or to indirectly electrify those hard to uh, electrify sectors such as heavy industry or heavy uh, transport. So as you can see, power to gas will actually open several solutions ahead of us, but sector coupling does not only limit, is not only limited to uh, power to gas. It can also mean uh, coupling the electric sector with other sectors, such as heat and transport, which means that we can actually extend the power to gas concept to power to X. X represents gas, heat, transport. In fact, by end of 2017 and early 2018, there were around 128 demo projects of power to X in the EU, of which around 63 were already in operation, 27 were uh, uh, finished, but not, uh, they were not in operation yet. And then we had 38 projects, demo projects, they, which were 
commission not yet in operation. So uh, it means that sector coupling will eventually lead to interlinking and interconnection of several sectors with, electric, with the electricity sector, and which will require us to interlink and to integrate and to coordinate all these sectors together. This will lead to another concept, energy system integration. So what does energy system integration mean? It means that we have to coordinate and plan the energy sector as a whole, as one system. We have to plan and coordinate all sectors of energy, including gas, electricity, etc. When we are talking about energy system integration, we are not only talking about supply or infrastructure side. We are also talking about the consumer side. To make this more clear, I will compare what we have today to what we might have as an integrated energy system in the future. Today, most of the uh, energy flow are one-sided and one above a di from, to one direction. So it is from, uh, for example, gas uh, power, uh, gas uh, plants or gas uh, sites to uh, the, the transport sector. So it is from suppliers, one direction from supplier to final consumer. So, and it is only one vector of energy. It is only, for example, gas, or it is only, for, for example, electricity from the electricity suppliers to final electricity consumers, which could be households or industries. So it is currently, it is uh, one directional from suppliers to consumers and one vector of energy, either gas, electricity, other forms of uh, other forms of energy, including, for example, heat. What would emerge as an integrated energy system would differ. It means that we are going to have bidirectional flow of energy, which is not only from suppliers to consumers. It can only be from consumers to suppliers and from consumers to consumers. And then we are going to have also several energy vectors converting to each other. So the change or what's going to change is two-sided, both on the energy vector side and also uh, on the, the direction of the energy flows. And uh, it is important and it can bring benefits. Why? Because it can be uh, helpful in decreasing energy waste by converting different energy vectors with each other to each other. And it can eventually help us decreasing the cost of energy and to help us to reach our decarbonization goals by 2050. Seeing all these benefits of energy system integration, EU Commission has also introduced under the Green Deal an EU energy system integration strategy. And it did it on uh, July 7, 2000, uh, on July 8, 2020. And uh, under this strategy, besides uh, bringing out the benefits of energy system integration, the EU Commission has also proposed six pillars for an integrated energy system. First is a circular energy system based on efficiency. So uh, once again, considering efficiency first principle in all the calculations of the EU Commission. Also here at the in, in energy system integration strategy. Then increased electrification based on renewable electricity sources, which means that we are going to need more and more uh, sources of renewable electricity sources uh, and the electricity, the renewable electricity generation and use these renewable uh, electricity generations to uh, electrify those sectors uh, which are possible to electrify, including, for example, e-mobility. Then the third pillar is renewable and low carbon fuels, including hydrogen in hard to debate sectors. So which it means basically uh, going back to the power to gas uh, concept, 
and to convert electricity to gases such as hydrogen and to use this hydrogen uh, to indirectly electrify those that, uh, sectors which are hard to electrify and to decarbonize those sectors. And so there is an important, uh, uh, so the EU, actually the EU Commission uh, gives an importance to these types of technologies through the EU energy system integration strategy. Then the fourth pillar is empowering consumers' choice, uh, which is something uh, important. As said before, under an integrated energy system, consumers will be more active and the uh, flow of energy is not only between uh, suppliers and consumers, also between these two, between consumers and consumers. And uh, then we will have infrastructure integration, which is uh, the main, let's say, component of an in integrated energy system, because we are going to uh, plan and coordinate all these sectors together, and we are going to integrate them together. And these sectors are not only energy sectors. Uh, so it is not only gas, electricity, or heat sector. It is also consumer side sectors, including transport or industry. So uh, we are going to need to integrate all these sectors together for an integrated energy system. Then the last pillar, but uh, not the, uh, one of the most important pillars, to say, is digitalization of a smarter interconnection. So digitalization is one of the as enabling, enabling uh, technologies, let's say, that would actually uh, help us to integrate energy system without digitalization and via, without using the benefits of the digitalization, we cannot integrate uh, all these suppliers, users, or uh, uh, sectors with each other. And it is well, the, a vital component of energy system integration. So uh, all of these pillars are very important. And uh, under the EU strategy, uh, the uh, commission also uh, points out that we are going to need to modify several existing guidelines and legislations uh, in, in the EU to actually be able to implement energy system integration. It's a very important issue and it's going to be uh, somehow challenging maybe, uh, but it is only one of the challenges and barriers uh, with respect to implementing energy system integration. In fact, there are going to be technical, economic, policy, and regulatory barriers. And this brings me to the second question from you. Which of the following barriers and challenges do you consider to be the most important ones in emergence and in reaching to an integrated energy system? Technical, economic, regulatory, or policy barriers? Well, I can understand that it's a hard question to answer because all of these barriers are very important, but maybe we can group them. And uh, in fact, so there are several studies that uh, have uh, done that and uh, they have uh, regrouped these challenges and barriers into two groups. Uh, one short run or short term barriers and challenges, including te technical and economic barriers and the long term barriers, including very regulatory and policy barriers. So there are several studies that uh, highlight the benefits of energy system integration. And uh, also there are several studies that they highlight the, the costs uh, of the energy system integration. These costs can be uh, either from a technical point of view the technologies, for example, are not yet developed, or if they are developed, they are not yet uh, commercially matured or economically matured, and uh, so they are still very costly. And then there are also other costs that are economic costs uh, with respect to integrating high amounts of renewable electricity and uh, generation into the power sector or in the power infrastructure, power infrastructure. In fact, there is a study that shows that uh, following a pass, a sector coupling pass or an integrated energy system pass and approach, we are going to need an increase of 75% of the generating capacity. This will require huge amounts of investments and it will be very costly. This is a challenge which needs to be 
uh, addressed, of course. But we need to also consider that there are some studies that show that of, of, also, of, of course, uh, they acknowledge that there are going to be huge amounts of costs, but there are some benefits of the energy system integration that would actually offset and balance those costs in the long, ter uh, in the long term. So in the short term, it might be very costly to have an, an integrated energy system, and we are going to uh, actually address and debate and uh, overcome technical and uh, economic uh, issues mostly cost issues, but in the long term, these cost issues would be offset and balanced with the benefits that we are going to get. As said, uh, there are only the, the techno-economic uh, barriers are only a group of barriers. We are, going to, we are going to face a second group of barriers, which are regulatory and policy barriers. And they are mostly considered to be long-term barriers in the literature and the, the studies that have been done so far. Um, these barriers, they include, for example, uh, the innovation, the type of innovation that we are going to uh, have in order to enable energy system integration. What are these innovation? Who is going to decide uh, what types of innovation uh, are, they are? And who is going to push for these innovations? So uh, normally it is policymakers who would decide and push for this uh, type of innovation. But still, the, there is a debate say, talking about uh, whether policy now is the right, whether the policymakers are the right, uh, let's say, entity to turn to when we are going to decide about the innovation that is going to need, be needed for energy system integration. Then there is the problem of uh, coordination, which is very important. Again, we are going to have a huge number of, uh, uh, an increased number of stakeholders, consumers, suppliers, and also infrastructure operators uh, to be integrated with each other across several sectors of the economy, including, uh, for example, uh, electricity and gas sectors, uh, and gas and the heat sectors, which are, which are energy infrastructures and energy sectors, and then also transport or industry, or and also digitalization. So the coordination is one of the main problems that is being debated right now, and. Uh, then we will have also the consumer acceptance and behind the meter behavior as one of those regulatory and policy uh, barriers and challenges. Uh, as said before, consumers will play an important role in an integrated energy system, and uh, we are going to need to have the consent from the, con the consent from consumers uh, to be involved in such a system and such an approach. Uh, then we have regulatory capabilities um, in order to implement energy system integration and in order to in coordinate with each other uh, to actually come up with the right policies and regulations for energy system integration. Because as you already know, uh, we have regulators for energy sectors right now, gas and electricity sectors. And then we, we also have uh, regulators for, for example, transportation sector. These regulators need to communicate with each other and to coordinate with each other, which is not something uh, easy to do. And uh, this is something that needs to be addressed and need to be discussed uh, thoroughly if we are going to have an integrated energy system. And there are also several other uh, policies which might not be yet uh, recovered or uh, which are not yet be, be uh, mentioned by uh, uh, the studies and uh, they, they are not yet discussed. But of course, uh, they're going to emerge in the path towards energy system integration. Uh, here, uh, we try to uh, introduce some of these open issues, challenges and barriers, uh, but uh, it is only the starting point, and we are going to have uh, probably so many discussions in the future regarding energy system integration. It's only an introduction. It's not yet a matured subject, and it, it's, it, it actually makes it very interesting because we are going to have lots of things to discuss and debate.